class. So today we're going into Aristotelian virtue ethics. And so one thing I like to always tell classes before we do that is that Aristotelian virtue ethics sets up how it is that we're understanding natural law theory. And then also it has a significance as far as deontology as well. So virtue ethics, natural law theory, and then also a little bit aspects of deontology figure into how we understand virtue ethics as well. Okay, so right now, obviously, we are looking at a paper titled Aristotelian Virtue Ethics, and it's really a chapter out of an online textbook by uh, Mark Dimmick and Andrew Fisher. So what was interesting is that at the opening, we find this quote, and the quote is by Ivan Panin, and he's kind of an interesting fellow. He was a mathematician who actually envisioned a way that the Bible is understood numerically in this rather uh, complicated mathematical understanding. But aside from that, the quote is, to seek virtue, so quote, to seek virtue for the sake of reward is to dig iron with a spade of gold. So we want to ask ourselves, what does he mean by that? Okay, so let's just read it one more time. To seek virtue for the sake of reward is to dig for iron with a spade of gold. So in other words, the goal of virtue has to do with not reward, but virtue itself. So in other words, this is better understood as non-consequentialist. Okay, so in other words, the quote has a non-consequentialist meaning, whereby we're seeing that virtue ethics is non-consequentialist. Okay, and all that really shows us is that the goal of the moral agent is to uh, act on principle rather than acting for a consequence in mind, okay? So you're not aiming toward a consequence as far as the moral action is concerned. You are acting on principle, and when you act on principle in that way, that is considered non-consequential, okay? So interesting uh, choice for the initial quote there by uh, Ivan Panin, the math, uh, mathematician Ivan Panin. So, of course, we're looking at virtue ethics and Aristotle, right? So Aristotle, as we've said, was born in 384 BC, died in 322 BC. So he was 60 something years old. Uh, he was obviously an ancient Greek philosopher. Uh, I like to refer to him as a polymath as well. So his ethical theory is his practical ethics, right? So around a, the focus of character, and as I always point out, the Greek word for character is ethos, right? Which is, uh, which is in contrast to other ethical theories we'll study this semester. So in other words, the, the emphasis on character for the virtue ethicist in the context of uh, Aristotle is to show us that you're not focused on the act itself. You're focused on, uh, on the consequence of the act itself. You're focused on developing your character, right? So uh, Aristotle was also known as a teleologist, whereby our first uh, function our first cause, our telos, is eudaimonia. So we have a function. Uh, our final cause has to do with what our telos is. And our telos for Aristotle is eudaimonia. Okay, so as referenced in uh, his book, his famous book on ethics, Aristotle's famous book on ethics, the uh, Nicomachean Ethics, all right? And so uh, for Aristotle, 
it is good to have our function by way of reasoning uh, as, uh, as taking us to eudaimonia, right? So the, the goal there is good to have our virtue uh, in line with our function, our telos, toward uh, eudaimonia, and we understand this by way of reasoning. So, uh, yet not just reasoning in the abstract, so reasoning as a way to act. To reason in accordance with our actions is to build and develop our character, our ethos. Okay, so we're always, when we're in the context of Aristotle, we're always thinking of reasoning as the central focus and then also seeing eudaimonia as the ultimate goal. And, of course, this is understood by reason, but the way to get to eudaimonia has to do with virtue, right? And virtue in the way that we act. So this isn't just focused on how we think about things, right? We're focused also on how we act. So eudaimonia is understood as flourishing and not to be mistaken for momentary habit. So momentary happiness is ephemeral and fleeting. Uh, it, eudaimonia, is our aim. Or if eudaimonia is our aim, eudaimonia is reached and understood naturally, cognitively, and rationally. Right? So with, with a rationally uh, act, while we rationally act in accordance to reason, we use our mind and body to bring about goodness and virtue. This is a practical philosophy. Okay, so we must understood we must understand first and foremost that Aristotelian virtue ethics is a practical philosophy. Oftentimes the discipline of ethics is referred to as practical philosophy, by the way. Okay, so virtue is to be practiced. Okay, so when we're thinking of it as practical, that, mean vir that means that virtue is then to be practiced. Um, our authors, Dimmick and Fisher, identify virtue theory as a moral theory that is agent-centered rather than act-centered, right? So that's what we opened with as a little thinking about how there's that difference between uh, consequentialism and non-consequentialism. So this is a little bit on that as well on that focus, as act-centered moral theory is a moral theory whereby we base the application of the theory onto specific acts and actions. This is not necessarily a bad judgment for the act-centered theories, rather just another way to evaluate ethical life. Okay, so they're showing that there's a difference between act-centered and agent-centered theories. So the theories uh, such as like deontology and utilitarianism are understood as act-centered, and Dimmitt and Fisher are showing that there's a difference there. Okay. Now, the reason why that's tricky is with the difference there between deontology and virtue ethics, because I'm also thinking that deontology is non-consequentialist as well. So if I said that just a moment ago, let's be careful to not uh, confuse deontology with, uh, non, with, with uh, consequentialism, because deontology is not a consequentialist theory. So I need to make that clear before I start that thread on the wrong foot. So Aristotle's virtue ethics is agent-centered, meaning the focus is on our character development and how I should be. So it's less about specific actions and more about character dispositions. So higher order habits might refer to character dispositions or psychological dispositions, also reasonable dispositions in the sense that we're understanding how it is that we're ethical reasonably as well, right? So next we move to the golden mean, okay? So 
not to be confused with the golden rule. Students often make the confusion that the golden mean is the golden rule. They're not the same thing. Okay, so the golden mean has to do with a rational organization of virtue held between a deficiency and a or a privation versus an excess. Okay, so the golden mean has to do with virtue held between excess and privation or uh, deficiency. Okay, so of course we see this as a management of virtue, more or less as a balancing between privation and excess, right? So we see it as a kind, the golden mean is a kind of balance between an excess and a deficiency. Okay, so the bal this balancing must be recognized as natural, okay? So, oh, excuse me, as rational, i.e., what is rational is structural. Rational acts are organized and recognized in the golden mean, whereby virtue is recognized and measured as a golden mean between two vices, okay? Because it falls in the middle that's an understanding rationally that it falls between the excess and the privation. So we must always, our authors don't emphasize this as much, but I, I like to emphasize this for classes because it's really important. It's a subtlety to the way we're understanding the incorporation of rational thought with Aristotle. Okay, So uh, then the golden mean, so for example, the golden mean of courage is recognized by its relation uh, between the privation of cowardice and the excess of hate, excuse me, <laughs> and the excess of haste. Okay, so um, overacting versus uh, being cowardly, the middle of the extreme and the privation then is courage, right? So too, li too little or too much action is understood in the rational context of the golden mean. Okay, so always understand that the golden mean is a way that we understand virtue rationally. Okay, Dimmick and Fisher don't point this out as much as I do, and again, I think it's important to do so. Okay, so Dimmick and Fisher point at such rational thinking, uh, point that such rational thinking is an act and likewise something to develop into a way of being toward flourishing, right? So such behaviors of life are therefore understood simply as habits, okay? So don't underestimate that word habit there um, as having a great deal of importance for how we're understanding this. So and then also don't understand habits to mean something that is instinctual, okay? Something that you just do uh, without thinking about it. Habits are in this context are always understood rationally and as thoughtfully considered, okay? So in other words, you want to create habits by where, whereby you are acting with rational consideration in the way that you're understanding your comportment toward the flourishing life, eudaimonia, and likewise virtue, right? So we live these uh, we live these traits in order to develop them. Okay, so we live these traits. When we are indicating that we're living this traits, these traits, that's indicating that we're creating a habit whereby we are enacting our lives toward virtue, right? So Aristotle's philosophy should be understood intellectually, practically, and when we're referring to practically, we're referring to such things as habits, right? So, in other words, virtue ethics is understood as encapsulating all three aspects of action, right? Intellectual, practical, and habitual uh, aspects of action as they are incorporated in our lives, right? Not just thinking about it, but enacting it with our actions, our bodies, in fact, right? So to live a virtuous life 
is never something that is understood intellectually alone. It is understood in tandem with habitual practice. Actions are louder than words, right? So our actions and our habits, our decisions, therefore, define us, right? The development, the skill of habit, aiming for virtue to achieve eudaimonia is otherwise known as phronesis or practical wisdom. The Greek word for uh, practical wisdom is phronesis, right? Or practical know-how. So yes, we learn by examples or the examples of others, right? The virtuous examples of others as a way to develop phronesis. Therefore, that proves that we are social and that we are communal. So I'm not having you read the rest of the chapter. So I believe that I have you stop at page seven because I don't want to untangle the points that they're making on ignorance and such uh, because I think that right now this sets the stage for how it is that we're understanding virtue ethics and then we could take it from there in uh, our classwork. Okay, so thank you class and talk to you later.